What should we do with a drunken whaler? Slice his throat with a lusty cleaver. Way, hey, and up she rises early in the morning. Feed him to the rat for dinner. Stuff a sack and throw him over. Way, hey, and up she rises early. No, 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 no. We're not starting here. Let's go back. Circanos, Tivia, Morley, and Gristol. They are the Isles. They are the Empire. But they are not the world. Remember this. Some 200 years before the assassination of Empress Jessamine Caldwin, the Empire was created from a bloody conflict between the islands. Gristol, which homes Dunwall City, was the victor. Gristol became the crown of the new empire and Dunwall, its capital city. More conflict ensued, as one might expect. A religious war called the Rectification War, in which the Abbey of the Everyman purged the Isle of Gristol of other religions. The Abbey established itself as the state religion and embedded itself into the politics of the empire. One of the islands, a place called Morley, viciously fought the oppressive rule of the empire, keen on maintaining its autonomy. Frequent assassination attempts on the Gristol monarchy from Morley eventually led to the Morley insurrection, though that wasn't the entirety of the story. The influential and wealthy industrialists of Gristol had for a long time exploited the people of Morley for cheap labor and their resources. The insurrection ended with a famine in Morley and many of the natives being forced to flee their homeland. You see, the empire was not a utopia. In fact, far from it, but I won't go on about political intrigue, industry, or power struggles. Instead, let's look to the east, to a land called Pandesia. This strange continent has not been tamed, not by a long shot, and perhaps it shouldn't be. The overseers of the Abbey described Pandesia as a place of horror and heresies, a place of cults, of sub-men who engaged in brutal and perverse rituals, a place of vast deserts, deep jungles, and otherworldly creatures. Once in a generation, a great effort is mounted to build a colony there in hopes of this someday growing into a port city to rival Dunwall itself. But to date, these attempts have all ended in madness and failure. The inhabitants of Pandesia are secretive, reclusive, one might say primitive when compared to the Isles, but they have survived here for generations, in a place that the mighty empire could not even gain a foothold. Though, there have been many scientific expeditions to Pandesia. One of the very first documented expeditions we know of comes from the journey of Lord Preston Moray and his wife Vera Moray. The jet-setting duo were quite powerful within the Isle of Gristol, among the most powerful family names, in fact. Though we don't know exactly what happened to the expedition at Pandesia, Vera Moray returned to Gristol, well, quite mad. She'd taken an interest in the bone charms, the runes, the black magics of Pandesia. She'd caught the eye of a being called the Outsider, a representative of the Void, who was still worshipped in these lands. Once the Outsider had a following within the Isles at the dawn of the Empire, the Abbey of the Everyman made sure to see that the followers of the Outsider were purged from the land. The Abbey dubbed them heretics, but in Pandesia, the worship of the Outsider and practices of black magics still carried on, and Vera More fell deep into their beliefs. She was institutionalized upon return. She lost her status in higher society, she murdered her husband and used his carcass to make bone charms and black magic reagents. She lived in the slums of Dunwall and became Granny Rags. From the writings of a man named Anton Sokolov, we get further insight into what it was like to travel to Pandesia. The voyage across the sea is long and fraught with danger. Sokolov lost half of his crew before reaching the shores of Pandesia through sickness, phenomenal weather, infighting, and poisoning from fish that flew through the waves of the sea near Pandesia. More of the crew yet died during the cliff climb to reach the damned place. Sokolov had a frightful obsession with the Outsider, but alas, Sokolov could not find the Outsider even here, unlike Vera More. Only a handful of Sokolov's crew made it back to the Isles, but unlike Vera More, 
Anton Sokolov returned with his sanity intact. For years, Sokolov tried to summon the Outsider with black magic and sacrificial rituals. He tried to read the bone charms and create runes, but he wasn't chosen by the Outsider to carry his mark, so Sokolov couldn't comprehend the void knowledge of the Outsider. Sokolov was far too uninteresting to garner the favor of the Outsider, though he certainly did try his best, didn't he? He tried with his best efforts and in the end, disgusted the Outsider. Anton Sokolov went on to become the head of the Academy of Natural Philosophy and an innovator behind the militarization of Dunwall law enforcement and a contributor to the technologies that would empower the ultra-wealthy and subjugate their underlings. Expeditions led by overseers from the Abbey of the Everyman were made to Pandesia, though very few even returned. And those that did carried disease or madness with them, and if I may read to you a poem from a work called Death in the Month of Songs. She was shy in the month of hearths, hiding from my scented letters a sun-dappled cure for my loneliness. She was smiling in the month of rain, eating figs straight from the tree, a dream of sailing around the isles. She was wed in the month of clans to her sailor cousin from Colera, a shrill bird drilling at my chest. She was dying in the month of songs, struck by a disease from the east, a terrible kiss on her distant lips. Did you catch it? Struck by a disease from the east. There were a number of unknown diseases hidden within Pandesia that could spell disaster for the unprepared masses of other lands, but one in particular was documented and known to be especially brutal in its efficiency, the plague which was observed in action upon High Overseer Scott Grafton, who journeyed to Pandesia and died of the plague. In the proper sects and creative collectives of the Empire, the plague is known to exist in Pandesia long before its journey into the slums of Dunwall. Before Jessamine Caldwin took the throne as Empress at the age of 20, her father, Euhorn Caldwin, ruled over a time of growth and peace within Dunwall and the Empire. The Caldwin family rose to power after the assassination of Empress Larissa Oluskir, when no heir was left to take the throne. Euhorn Caldwin appointed Corvo Atano as Jessamine's royal protector when she reached 12 years old, as was custom in the courts for all youth who were deemed to be futures of the monarch. The royal protector was an esteemed position, a life of service to the ruler of the empire, acting as their bodyguard, their messenger, their food taster. They were ever present and important. For a royal protector to ever act against or to betray their emperor would be unthinkable. When Euhorn Caldwin died, Jessamine took the throne at the age of 20. The now empress and her royal protector Corvo had been romantically involved with each other for two years at this point. An industrial boom began with Empress Jessamine at the helm, as did games of political intrigue and internal power struggles. Empress Jessamine ruled in service to the people of Dunwall and the Empire. She was perhaps what some more strict militant types would call lax or naive. She kept the Dunwall tower grounds open to citizens, she rejected calls for increased security for herself, and trusted those within her inner circle to such a degree that she did not question them in motive or judgment. Two years into her rule, she gave birth to her daughter, Emily. Born out of wedlock, it was clear who the father of the child was, though Emily was accepted as the future heir to the throne of the empire, and the issue of her father's identity was never raised, neither within governing bodies nor within the populace. As Emily grew, she was quite close to her father, Corvo, though it's unlikely that she explicitly knew that Corvo was her father. He was a father figure to her at the least, and a constant presence as she grew. The royal spymaster, Hiram Burroughs, took issue with Jessamine, with Emily, their choices, their chaos. Hiram Burroughs took the role of royal spymaster five years into Empress Jessamine's rule. When he looked upon Dunwall, he saw a glorious city being rotted from within by the empowered poor and the fetid growing slums of the city. From every corner, he saw a threat and a scheme, 
and when he looked at little Emily Caldwin, he saw a spoiled child squandering away her potential as a future empress with games of imagination and the fawning of her mother. In his eyes, the decline of the city was well underway, and with an uninterested empress on the throne, a woman who would not confront the pestilence that was the lower class, well, here in Burroughs took initiative that was afforded to a man of his position. As the royal spymaster, he acted with very little oversight, so to clean up the city, to rid it of the filthy, lazy, lower class, Burroughs commissioned the Plague of Pandesia to be brought to Dunwall. Carried by the bully rats native to a foreign place, it was released into the slums under order of the royal spymaster Hiram Burroughs. Burroughs was a man of order. Everything happened with a purpose. Orders were followed. Everything should be predictable. So, imagine his frustration when the rat plague began its work and his quarantines failed. His curfews failed. His orders were not heeded by the citizens of Dunwall and the bully rats bred at such a rate that they could not be contained. Therefore, the rat plague didn't just kill those in the slums, no, it spread. And Empress Jessamine refused to order strict quarantines, refused to deport from overpopulated districts, refused to take hard measures to stop the plague. First comes the turning of the skin to a sickly shade, the inability to consume nutrition, muscles fade away, weight drops, hair falls out before the cough settles in. Once a victim bleeds from their eyes, well, you cannot help them. The brain is slowly destroyed. Eventually, insects will infest the victim and violent outbursts will begin. The whole ordeal is highly contagious. Through the weeks and months, medical professionals struggled against the plague. City officials do what they can to stop the spread, but it's so aggressive and no one has the power to stop it. The Empress does not enforce measures to stop it out of a misguided sense of kindness and service. Those in power who do wish to act are the ones responsible for it in the first place. The rich are able to buy their way out from infection for a time, but eventually the sickness comes for them too. Even the ultra-rich and politicians are driven to live in fear of the plague. Not quite two years after the plague's commencement, Empress Jessamine sends the royal protector Corvo Atano away from Dunwall to the neighboring isles of the empire, to the other great cities, to ask for aid and request guidance, anything to help Dunwall and the Isle of Gristol. By now, bodies are beginning to pile up in the streets. Mass dump sites are being readied, but the plague has not reached its full potential. Not by a long shot. With Corvo Atano gone, the Empress is less defended. Though, why would this ever cross her mind? Why shouldn't she send a Corvo around the Isles as her representative? She has nothing to fear from those within her own government, except the patience of the royal spy master here in Burroughs in his inner circle has gone. And Empress Jessamine wanted Burroughs himself to investigate the source of the plague within the city. Whoops. Well, what a pickle. What a conflict of interest. Paranoia and fear joined the fray within Hiram Burroughs. The infestations of the slums and the plague went completely awry, out of control, no thanks to the poorly trained lower class who just couldn't follow strict quarantine protocol and the gentle approach by the Empress. Well, order was gone. And royal spymaster Hiram Burroughs demanded order. Not only that, but now he had to fret over his own involvement with the plague's release into the city being discovered. The Empress was very interested in this matter. With Corvo out of Dunwall, Burroughs puts into play events that would end in Empress Jessamine's death, a royal assassination. And in her place, Burroughs would rule as Lord Regent until Emily Caldwin came of age. Order would be restored, Dunwall would be remade, and it would be better for it. Here in Burroughs commissioned the assassination by a man named Dodd, who was the knife of Dunwall. And here we must stop for a moment to talk about him, the outsider. 
Now is a good time to discuss this figure, not because he's a savior nor is he a villain, but rather he strikes me as just a being dedicated to chaos and curiosity. The type who would give a caveman fire just to watch him burn himself with it. Or perhaps the caveman could learn to use it. There's only one way to find out. But the outsider doesn't give a damn, one way or another, how political games play out. Things so dire and important to the Isles means nothing to a being from the Void. And we see this play out several times, Vera More being marked by the outsider when she was in Pandesia. It allowed her to read and create bone charms and runes. It gave her powers and sights, it drove her mad, but she lived on as Granny Rags. The Outsider gave visions to great inventors like Piero Joplin, to the lonely and beaten like a child from the streets, to a witch in Bridgemore, as he himself says to another marked one later, how you use what I have given you falls upon you, as it has to the others before you. The Outsider, this morally ambiguous creature of the void and chaos, has long since marked Dodd the assassin, the man who will kill the empress. Dodd has for over 15 years risen through the underworld ranks as the leader of a gang called the Wailers. For 15 years, he has shared his power with those he's trained up in the gang, and through targeted assassinations, they've worked to rid Dunwall of what they considered to be the undesirables of the city. Though by the year Jessamine's assassination was commissioned, Dodd and the Outsider were no longer on speaking terms, so to speak, but Dodd was just as powerful and infused with the magics of the Outsider as ever. So, using these gifts from the Void, Dodd and his whalers did indeed pull off the murder of Empress Jessamine Caldwin and the kidnapping of Emily Caldwin. This is witnessed by the royal protector, Corvo Atano, having just returned from his journey around the Isles with poor news. The other Isles will be cutting off contact with the infested Dunwall. There will be no aid. Corvo is left with Jessamine, watching her die in his arms. Emily is taken from his custody. And now, the blame for her murder falls squarely upon him. Welcome to the beginning of the game. Now, from here, there are choices to be made and we'll talk about options as we go. I know, certainly, no one wants to know what kind of playthrough I did. Uh. Oh, no! No one touches me! No! <laughs> Who are you? Watch this. <laughs> no, no, we'll, we'll leave it open to choice. Corvo Atano is in custody and tortured for six months after the death of Jessamine Caldwin and the kidnapping of Emily Caldwin. Royal Spymaster Hiram Burroughs is now Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs, convincing the ruling powers of Dunwall and the vast majority of its denizens that Corvo is guilty of murdering the Empress wasn't really difficult. The general population didn't know or care about Corvo Atano. They had their own lives and worries to see to. Corvo was close to the Empress and their daughter, but that didn't apply to other people within Dunwall Tower. Corvo was a prime candidate to take the fall. His arrival back at Dunwall was a happy coincidence for now Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs. The perfect scapegoat just fell right into his lap, so Corvo has been tortured to get a false confession, but he doesn't break. His date of execution draws near, however, confession or not, he is still deemed guilty and will hang for it. Corvo is assisted in a jailbreak by a group of loyalists, led by a nobleman called Pendleton and an admiral named Havelock. Of note, amidst the many faces that compose the loyalist force is one in particular, Piero Joplin, the genius mind who has been touched by the outsider, who is haunted by nightmares from the outsider, and who has been creating a Void Nightmare-inspired mask in preparation for Corvo's arrival for several months. Piero knew not why he was crafting this mask, but he knew it would be of great importance, and he was not wrong. This mask 
would become Corvo's identity and disguise amongst the populace and leaders of Dunwall. Though its creation may seem to be a gift from the outsider, remember that the outsider doesn't play to favoritism. It's a tool. What Corvo chooses to do with it is simply a matter of interest to the outsider. Emerging from the Cold Ridge prison, Corvo finds a very sick Dunwall. Life-saving elixirs to stave off the plague are used as, as a currency, therefore a method of control by those in power. Young men found to be ill are used for labor and then killed before their eyes begin to bleed. The slums have been left to flood and rot. The ultra-wealthy hunker down in their estates. Bodies are left for pickup on the streets to be taken to the now-filling dump sites. The brutality and paranoia of the police force feeds off the brutality and paranoia of Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs. Some on the streets speculate that Dunwall has maybe three months left, or perhaps those left to suffer the plague have three months left. There are two very different worlds to be lived within the walls of Dunwall. At the Hound's Pit pub, the Loyalist leaders connive and plot. Though Corvo's intentions may align with theirs, that being the safe return of Emily Caldwin and her ascension to the throne, the language of the conspirators is very interesting. It's very self-serving, maybe a bit suspicious, but maybe we're just being paranoid. Editor Tiptoe here, and here Corvo gets his powers, he meets the outsider, he goes to the void, and it's all really cool, and we're just gonna move on. Sweet Jesus. The Loyalist leaders are the best chance Corvo has at getting Emily back. The city is suffering under Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs' vicious and orderly rule. The Abbey and its overseers are unchecked. So, measures must begin to undo the damage done to the Empire. The first step is the retrieval of an overseer from the Abbey, called Martin. Overseer Martin is rebelling against the Lord Regent and was captured. He is intended to stand as a leader amongst the Loyalists. Therefore, his retrieval from the office of the High Overseer is vital. Oh, and while Corvo's there, why not eliminate High Overseer Campbell? get his little black book. It's just full of blackmail-worthy information. And it has the location of Emily Caldwin as well. How you eliminate the High Overseer is up to you. Notice I didn't say kill. High Overseer Campbell, though a figurehead within the Abbey, is a true sinner. He breaks the seven strictures the Abbey preaches on a daily basis. He acknowledges this himself and rather treats it like a big joke a man of the church who lives like royalty. Corvo can kill him, sure, or you can maim him with the mark of a heretic. Then he'll be outcast, denied food and shelter for all the rest of his life, ostracized from society, left to walk the abandoned districts of Dunwall alone. Which is more befitting? Which is justice? How much chaos do you want to bring? With now former High Overseer Campbell's little black book in Overseer Martin's custody, he can use it like a weapon against those in power in Dunwall and leapfrog his way into the now vacant position of High Overseer. How fortunate for the Loyalists. But first, it's on to parliamentary politics with a mission from the nobleman called Pendleton, Trevor Pendleton. He asks Corvo, to get rid of his elder brothers, twins named Curtis and Morgan Pendleton. You see, they're corrupt politicians who would never break from the will of Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs because the Lord Regent pays them well for their votes. Eliminate the twins and their votes will pass on to their little brother, Trevor Pendleton. And it just so happens that where the twin brothers are playing is where Emily Caldwin is being held, the golden cat a brothel that frequently caters to the rich and influential, politicians and religious figures. During Corvo's time of imprisonment and torture, the Golden Cat had experienced a plague infestation. For a business that caters to the wealthy and powerful, experiencing a plague outbreak can be very bad for business. It's on this very day when Corvo arrives to find the Pendleton twins and little Emily Caldwin that reopening is commencing. 
with enhanced security to boot. Now, you don't have to outright kill the twins. There are other options, considered non-lethal, mind you, low chaos. You can work with a man named Slackjaw from the Bottle Street Gang. Seems Slackjaw has it out for the Pendleton twins, or maybe just has an interesting sense of justice. But turn the twins over to Slackjaw's men, and they'll shave their heads, cut out their tongues, and put them to work in their own silver mines. Their brother, Trevor Pendleton, will reflect better over this option, rather than having them killed outright. Though, and this is just a personal opinion, but Trevor Pendleton is a coward, a snake, a manipulator, and a hypocrite, so really, who cares what Trevor Pendleton thinks? Corvo retrieves Emily Caldwin from the Golden Cat and takes her back with him to the Hound's Pit, where the servants of the Loyalist leaders are ready to receive her. Now, remember Anton Sokolov. He's that fellow that went to Pandesia in his youth, searching for the outsider. He went on to head the Academy of Natural Philosophy and created technology to help militarize the Dunwall police force during Jessamine's rule as empress. Well, the loyalists need him. Anton Sokolov and Piero Joplin have a history, a bad one. Sokolov was quite jealous of Piero Joplin's quick rise to prominence when he entered the Academy of Natural Philosophy many years ago, and Sokolov had Piero removed from the Academy as a result. There is very bad blood between the duo. Well, Anton Sokolov is also an accomplished painter, and having your portrait done by Anton Sokolov is seen as a mark of status. Anton Sokolov painted a woman who was a lover of the Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs. The Loyalists need information on where to find this woman. She was a huge financial supporter to Hiram Burroughs. That gravy train needed to end, and it would make everything just a touch more personal, wouldn't it? So, choose. You find her, Lady Boyle. You corner her. You can kill her, or you can give her over to someone, her stalker. You can disable her, take her into the bowels of the estate, and hand her over to a man who is obsessed with her, who will whisk her away to his home and keep her locked away from the world for his own uses. Now is the time to deal with the Lord Regent himself, Hiram Burroughs, at the Dunwall Tower. The order from Admiral Havelock is to kill Burroughs. The Lord Regent has fallen out of favor with the Abbey and in political circles. With the loss of his financial support after the disposal of Lady Boyle, now is the time to strike at the head of the snake. Now, as always, there are choices to be made in Corvo's approach. Killing Hiram Burroughs is satisfying, yes, especially knowing the origins of the plague outbreak within Dunwall. The man has killed thousands by his actions. This man is responsible for the murder of the Empress. He deserves something, certainly, but is it death that he deserves, or is it perhaps a spotlight? You see, you can take Hiram Burroughs' confession, where he confesses to everything, and you can get that confession into the hands of the propaganda officer inside the broadcasting room of Dunwall Tower. Bada bing, bada boom, death probably would have been easier on the now former Lord Regent. Upon return to the Hound Pits, it's all eat, drink, and be merry. Mission complete, all is well, that ends well. Well, you've probably guessed, given my footage. Well, I have to confess anyways. I killed everything with a pulse in my playthrough. So I'm I'm approaching this from a from a high chaos point of view. I tend to get a little bloodthirsty during streams. Admiral Havelock, Overseer Martin, and Nobleman Pendleton turned on their servants and fellow Loyalist conspirators. They feared what they'd done in the shadows, what they'd ordered Corvo to accomplish for them, would eventually be revealed to the public and that it could ruin their claims to power, be it now or in the future. To avoid any messy situations, they kill whoever they can get at the Hound Pits and order the boatman, Sam Beechworth, to poison Corvo. They take Emily Caldwin. She will one day sit as Empress, but for now, it's Admiral Havelock who will sit as Lord Regent until she is ready to become Empress, though the word ready can mean many things. Good old Sam, though. He only slipped Corvo half the poison. 
and he ferries Corvo to King Sparrow Island, where Havelock, Pendleton, and Martin wait, and where Emily Caldwin is locked away. One way or another, Pendleton and Martin will die, either by your hand, their own hand, each other's deeds, or by Havelock's poisonous scheming. Death and blackmail became habits for the trio, easy ways to deal with problems, carrying consequences they weren't willing to face. In the end, Corvo must deal with Lord Regent Havelock atop the King Sparrow Island lighthouse. Will things end peacefully? Will Havelock be cut down? Will Havelock kill himself with Emily in his arms? Will Corvo save Emily? Will she live on and become Emily the Wise? Or will she become the Terror of Dunwall? The choices you made along the way will guide you to your finale. The most canon ending being the good one. Corvo saves Emily under a low chaos rating. Emily goes on to become Empress and a force of good in the Empire. All is well that ends well. Or you could live that life of chaos and ruin, just like old Tiptoe did. You can watch the world burn. Kill everyone that stands in your way. Destroy the throne of the Empire. Destroy Dunwall. You can leave it all behind. And sail away for some place new.